Good morning. This is our 13th session of Anderson Stories. And I am in New York City. And I'm home, as so many of us are all over the world. So we miss being at the statue, but we're having a wonderful time together. And this morning we have two fabulous storytellers, Katie Green and Megan Hicks. And I'm going to introduce you once again to Simon Brooks so he can tell you something about uh, StreamYard and the internet platform and what to look forward to. And thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone's doing absolutely fabulous <laughs> on this wet day here in New London, New Hampshire, at least. Um, I just want to remind you that this is a internet live broadcast and as such during covid time we may lose some or all of us hopefully not all of us um <laughs> but please stick around something will happen we will make something um come out of it uh if a storyteller is lost we'll have them come back at the end and finish off the story so do not leave your sets <laughs> <laughs> and please do comment on the side um where you're from. Laura loves to see where everyone's from. And uh, Simon does too. I do too. It's true. It's both <laughs> of us. Everybody loves to see where you're from. Anyway, um, today, as Laura said, we do have some amazing storytellers. And one of those amazing storytellers is Katie Green. And I've known, I've met Katie Green years ago at Sharing the Fire, which is a, a New England, Northeast storytelling conference and festival and what i didn't know about katie that she sent to me today was that she actually has done anti-violence training which is um what is it it's a non she is a non-violence trainer um and she is also a grandmother and a storyteller and she likes to use stories to bring people closer together which i think is what we all like to do because she like me believes that stories can change the world. Please enjoy Katie Green and her story of Grandmother Elderberry. Uh, thank you. It's, it's really a joy to be here um, virtually with uh, Hans Christian whoops, over here. <laughs> so I've, I've been at the statue several times. It's always a high point in my storytelling. Um, but to tell Mother Elderberry today is a real joy to me because it it really celebrates the natural world. And uh, it captures, this story captures Anderson's love of Denmark. And also I think, I, I see this story as, as sort of a prayer since Ad, uh, Anderson never married, fell in love several times. Um, and this is a story of um, two older people. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a boy who got his feet wet and caught a cold. His mother put him in his pajamas and tucked him in bed and got out the teapot to make a pot of elderberry tea, which is very good medicine. Just as she dropped the flowers into the teapot, their neighbor from upstairs came in to visit. He'd heard the boy was sick. And he said, hmm, so how did this boy manage to get his feet wet when it hasn't rained for so long? And the boy looked at the man and said, oh, tell me a story. Because he knew that his neighbor upstairs, even though he had never married and never had children of his own, was a wonderful storyteller. It was just a joy to listen to him talk. <laughs> well, the man looked at the boy and said, well, <laughs> I'll tell you a story, but um, you must tell me exactly how deep the water is in that ditch next to your school. Oh, well, it, it's almost to the top of my boots. I think we know how the feet got wet now. And now I suppose I should tell you a story, but uh, you've heard all the stories I know. Oh, but mother says that everything you see or touch, you can turn into a story or a fairy tale. Hmm. That kind of story really isn't worth much. <laughs> the real fairy tales are the stories that come knocking at my head and saying, let me in. Oh, not even a king 
can command when a story will come. But look, look at your teapot there. Here comes one now. And the boy looked at the teapot next to him and he saw that the lid was slowly rising up. It was being pushed up by branches of an elder tree with flowers on it where those branches grew and grew and there was even a branch coming out of the teapot spout. They grew until it was a tree that had branches reaching over his bed and the tree was covered with elder flowers. And sitting in the tree, there was a friendly looking old lady wearing an odd dress where her dress looked like a uh, exactly like the leaves and the flowers of the elder tree. Huh, he couldn't tell where the fabric ended and where the tree began. Who's that woman in the tree? The boy asked. Oh, well, oh, long ago, the Greeks and Romans used to call her Dryad. But we don't know that word. <laughs> um, the sailors who lived down in the new cottages, New cottages, they're 300 years old. <laughs> but those old sailors knew her and they called her Mother Elderberry. <laughs> now you watch the tree and see Mother Elderberry and, and I'll tell you a story. Down in the new cottages, there is a tree just like this elder tree and it is growing in one of the small backyards behind the new cottages. Underneath this tree, there sits an old, old man and an old, old woman. He's a retired sailor. They are so old, and they've been married so long that their children's children have grandchildren. And it's soon to be their uh, golden wedding anniversary. They don't know what day it is. And up in the tree, Mother Elderberry is grinning. And she says, I know what day their golden wedding anniversary is. But they don't hear her because they're so busy talking about days long gone by. <laughs> you know, said the old sailor, I think when we were young, we played in this very same yard. <laughs> Yes, we did. And, and we made a garden right over here and we, we planted twigs. Do you remember? Oh, yes, she said, I do remember. And we watered them. And one of the twigs was from an elder tree and it took root and, and grew and grew and grew. It grew until it became this very same tree that we're sitting under today. <laughs> Mm-hmm, yes. And over in that corner, there was an old tub where I used to sail the little boats that I carved. <laughs> oh, but I was to sail in a much larger boat than that. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, you, you did. You, you sailed for months, you were gone for years. You were gone so long, I, I, I thought you were dead. <laughs> and I used to go out and, and wait for you. <laughs> but do you remember the time that we went to school and learned things before you had to sail away and, and we went to confirmation and oh, how we both cried that day in church. And then we held hands and we walked all the way to the round tower and went up and looked all over Copenhagen and the sea. And then we went to the royal gardens in Fredericksburg and we saw the king and queen in their great boat. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I sailed in a different kind of boat. <laughs> I sailed, I was gone for years. Uh, I, I went to the warm countries where the poppy grows. <gasps> oh, yes. <laughs> and I cried so much. I used to wake up in the middle of the night and look at the weather vane to see if the wind had changed and it would bring you home. It changed plenty of times, but you didn't come home. <laughs> and then one day when I was working as a servant, 
I, I took out the trash and oh, it was raining so hard. I stood in the doorway, doorway with the trash and looked at the street, it was like a river. And then the postman came and gave me a letter. It was from you. <laughs> Oh, I stood there in the doorway and I opened that letter and read it. I laughed and I cried at the same time. I was so happy. <laughs> and you wrote about the warm country so beautifully. I felt as though I too were there. <laughs> and then I felt an arm go around my waist and ho, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> and you gave that fellow quite a smack. Well, how was I to know it was you? <laughs> you had come home at the same time that your letter reached me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and uh, then we were married uh, shortly after that, and uh, well, the children came. First there was Marie, and then uh, Peter, and Niels, and Hans Christian. <laughs> Oh yes, and now now they're all grown, and they have children, and they are such fine people. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I believe we were married about this time of year. And Mother Elderberry, up in the tree, leaned down and she put her head between the two old people and said, "Yes, today is your fiftieth wedding anniversary." And just then, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and their children came into that small yard. <laughs> they had been there earlier that morning to say happy anniversary, but the old people had forgotten. They remembered things from years and years and years ago, but they couldn't remember what happened that morning. Well, the children danced in front of them and said, we're going to have a feast. We're going to have a feast. And one of the little ones said, and we're going to eat roast potatoes. That was his favorite. <laughs> and everybody in the small yard, including Mother Elderberry, called out, hurrah. And the little boy with the cold looked at his neighbor and said, that wasn't a fairy tale. Hmm. Well, maybe it wasn't to you, um, but uh, let's ask Mother Elderberry, see what she says. Mother Elderberry looked down at the boy and said, you're right, that wasn't a fairy tale, but out of reality, with a little imagination, comes the fairy tale. And then she reached down and she picked up the boy and she held him close to her heart. And then the branches of the elder tree enfolded them. And they were in an arbor that, that seemed to be flying through the air. Oh, it was such a delightful feeling. And then all of a sudden, Mother Elderberry changed into a young girl. Well, she was still wearing that same dress that looked like elder tree leaves and elder blossoms, but her hair was golden curls and her eyes were so blue, it was a joy to look into them. And she had a wreath of elder flowers around her hair. She and the boy were the same age and they had the same joys in their minds and hearts. They held hands and they walked out of the arbor into a small yard of the new cottages. <laughs> and there in the yard, they saw the father's walking stick. But to the children, that walking stick looked like a stick horse. And so they picked it up and climbed on it like a stick horse. And the handle of the walking stick turned into a horse's head with a flowing black mane. And the boy said, we can ride for miles and miles. And they started running around that small yard. 
And while they ran, the little girl who was behind the boy, holding on to him, <laughs> she named everything in every place that they went. She said, oh, look, there's a farm over there. We're in the country. And you see all the chickens? Oh, look at that rooster. He's strutting so proudly. <laughs> oh, and there's a church up on the hill. And beside it, there are two large oak trees, and one of them's half dead. <laughs> and now we're going past the blacksmith. <gasps> Look, he's half naked, and the sparks are flying as he hits that hot iron. <laughs> and now we're coming to the castle, and everything that the girl named, the boy saw. Of course, we know she was really Mother Ellen. They climbed off of the stick horse and they played beside a gravel path. They made a garden, just like the old sailor and his wife had. And she took one of the flowers and planted an elder flower and whoop, it grew into a beautiful elder tree. And then the boy and girl held hands and walked. Oh. They didn't walk like the other children. They did not go to the round tower of Copenhagen. They did not walk to the royal gardens. Mm -mm. Instead, she wrapped her arms around his waist and they flew all over Denmark. <laughs> and the whole time, the young girl told the boy what they were seeing. The seasons changed. Spring became summer, became autumn, became winter again and again. <laughs> and all the while, the boy smelled the sweet scent of the elder flowers. <laughs> and then she said, look how beautiful spring is here. And they were standing in a newly leafed out beech forest. <sighs> and under their feet were the sweet Woodruff. And the anemones, the pink anemones were blooming everywhere. The boy said, I wish it were always spring. But look, she said, how beautiful summer is here. And then they were flying over an old knight's castle. And the old stones were reflected in the water of the moat that surrounded it. There were swans swimming there looking out into the forest, into the paths. Red and yellow flowers bloomed in the ditches, and hops and morning glories bloomed on the stone walls. Oh, said the boy, it is delightful here in the summertime. But look how beautiful autumn is here. And then the sky was twice as high and twice as blue, and there were Trails of geese flying above them. <laughs> and below, the wind was changing the cornfields into a sea of green. And the forests were aglow of, with green and gold and red. And in the barns, <laughs> there were children and women sorting hops. And the children were singing songs. And the women were telling stories of witches and wizards. Ah, oh, what could be more pleasant? <laughs> but look, how beautiful winter is here, she said. And all of the trees were covered with hoarfrost. They looked like white coral. And the sky was filled with shooting stars. And in the houses, Christmas trees were lit. There were gifts underneath. And out in the country, you could hear violins playing. And children were playing games for slices of apples. Even the poorest child could say, oh, it is beautiful here in the winter time. And it was beautiful. And all the while, the boy was having thousands of pictures in his mind and in his heart. And the years went on. The boy grew and became a man. And he was to sail away in a boat under the red flag with the white cross on it, just like the old sailor had done. And 
he went to the warm countries and stayed a long time where the coffee grows. <laughs> but before he left home, she gave him an elder flower and he put it into his prayer book. And while he was gone, no matter what country he was in, he could open his prayer book and it always opened to that place where the elder flower was. And the longer he looked at that flower, the more alive it seemed. And he could almost smell the smell of the forests in Denmark. And he could see the young girl with her golden curls. And he returned home. They grew old together until they were the old people sitting under the elder tree. <laughs> and up in the tree sat Mother Elderberry, looking down. She said, today is your golden wedding anniversary. And she took two flowers from the tree. She kissed them both. And they turned into silver and gold. And then she leaned down and she placed them on the heads of the two old people. And they became golden crowns. And there they sat under the elder tree, just like a king and queen. <laughs> and the old man told the old woman the story of elder, Mother Elder Tree, Mother Elderberry, just like he had been told the story when he was a boy. And the parts that they liked the best were the parts that were most like their own experiences. Up in the tree. Mother Elderberry looked down. That's the way it is. <laughs> some call me a dryad. Some call me Mother Elderberry. But my real name is Memory. I am the one who sits in the tree that grows and grows. And I remember everything. And that is how I tell stories. But tell me, do you still have that flower in your prayer book? And he opened his prayer book. It fell open right to that flower, and it looked as fresh as the day it had been placed there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the sun was setting, and there was a golden glow that made their cheeks rosy. They looked at each other reached out to hold each other's hands and they closed their eyes. That's the end of the story. And the boy, oh, that was so beautiful. He didn't know if he had been dreaming or if he had been listening to a story. But the upstairs, upstairs neighbor was leaving. The door was closing. And there was no elder tree in the room. <sighs> oh, mother, that was so beautiful. <sighs> I went to the warm countries. Mm -hmm. I don't wonder. Mm -hmm. Any little boy who drinks two whole cups of elderflower tea is going to go to the warm countries. <sighs> but mother, where is Mother Elderberry? She is in the teapot, and that is where she can remain. Mother Elderberry. Thank you. Thank you. How extraordinary a, a story by Anderson that is so much about his writing and his experience of storytelling. I, I think there are many in which there's stories within stories, but this story is really about memory and language and um, it's such a nice, beautiful response while you were telling the stories. People loved it, Katie. So. Thank you. Thank you. So, it was so nice to hear that story. Thank you so much.
And we'll be back at the very end where we can talk with Katie because she has spent a lot of her life devoted to Anderson's stories and, and the study of Anderson's life and, and literature. So it's a, a great delight to introduce our second storyteller, Megan Hicks. Here she is. <laughs> now, Megan is an extraordinary storyteller, just filled with vibrancy, and she loves to make stories. And I have a special thank you for Megan, because someone had to uh, back out, and she, with complete generosity <laughs> and bravery and love, <laughs> just leapt into this story. And you know, it's interesting how a story finds just the one who should tell it. But something about Megan, which reminds us very much of Anderson himself, is that Megan's also an artist, a, a craftsperson, who loves to take things that other people discard or don't pay a lot of attention to. And she turns it into clothing and boxes and jewelry and dolls and wonderful objects. It's a terrific. Um, it's also how she tells her stories. So without further ado, our wonderful friend and guest, Megan Hicks. This is the story of the great sea serpent. Now the story of the great sea serpent begins with a tiny little fish. I have forgotten his name, but if you're really curious, I'm sure you can find someone who remembers it. This little fish had 1,800 brothers and sisters, all born at exactly the same time, into a world where they didn't have a care in the world. They were surrounded with water, so water was not a problem, and their food just sort of came to them. Oh, it was a huge world full of various beautiful creatures. There were seahorses, there were eels, there were sharks, there were fish swimming around in schools. Some of the fish were so big they could have eaten all 1,800 of that little fish's brothers and sisters and him in one big gulp. But no one had tried that yet, so nobody was really worried about that happening. All they had to think about was swimming and swimming and swimming. Until one day, all of a sudden, from up above, there came crashing down into the water a huge, heavy, skinny, black thing that cut the water in half and sent all the fishes fleeing in terror. It came and kept coming and coming and coming and growing longer and longer and longer. They couldn't see the end of it. All the fish that it hit were knocked sideways and higgledy-piggledy and upside down, and some of them broke their backs. And in terror, all 1,800 of this little fish's brothers and sisters swam away. Well, almost all of them, there were about 10 that stayed with him all together. And after this thing finished crashing and finally, finally came to rest, they all kind of huddled together there in a little tiny school of fish. And they wondered, what on earth was that? What was that? Well, I can tell you what that was. That was the underwater telegraph cable invented by humans to stretch hundreds of miles to connect the countries of Europe with the country of, countries of North America. And it was meant to send messages and thoughts and ideas through that cable in a matter of seconds all the way from one coast to the other. That's what that was. Well, the fish, finally, their terror subsided and their fear gave way to curiosity. They said, I wonder what that thing is. They could see it far off and 
they remarked, you know, it's, it's really, really skinny, but who knows how big it might be able to make itself. It's lying there so still, but it might be up to something. You never know. And most of the little fishes said, you know, that is of no concern to us. I, I, think, I think we should be leaving. I think we should get out of here. But our little tiny fish said, no, we need to find out. And it came from above. So that's where we need to go to find out what it really is. And he started swimming up to the surface. And his brothers and sisters swam after him. At the top, they met a dolphin. Now, dolphins are thought to be amazingly intelligent creatures. This one, he was mostly focused on practicing his acrobatic routine. He was just working on a double backflip when these little fish interrupted his concentration to ask him about that thing that had crashed from the surface down to the bottom, and he didn't even know what they were talking about. He hadn't been paying attention to that. He couldn't answer them. It embarrassed him. So he did a double backflip and he swam away. Well, right then a seal came in. A seal came by and, well, we all know that seals are accustomed to eating little fish, but this one had just had breakfast, so she didn't eat them. She decided she would enlighten them. And she said, listen, I'll tell you what you want to know. I spend hours and hours and hours sitting on the rock, so miles and miles that way toward land. And I observe these creatures called humans. Now, these creatures called humans seem to be obsessed with the idea of catching us and imprisoning us. And mostly we get away. Sometimes we're not so fortunate, though, and we get captured. And well, the same thing happened to that poor creature down there. They had him in their power and they had him confined up there on land. Now, I don't know why they decided to move it, but they decided that it needed to go across the ocean to another country. So they forced it to get on board a ship. Oh, it fought them, it fought them mightily. I could hear it clanking and clattering as they Fought it to make it coil up into a tight, tight little coil. Finally, they got it on board the ship and it sailed away. But that's when the creature got away from them. It escaped. It slithered right over the edge. And oh, all those men on the ship, they tried to hang on to it. I could see them all hands on deck trying to get it back into the boat. But it got away from them. There's where it landed, right there. The little fish looked down. There it was. They couldn't see the end of it. Well, of course not, because it stretched hundreds of miles in both directions. But the little fish didn't know that, and they just saw what they saw, and they said, you know, it looks really, really skinny. Well, yes, that's because they starved the poor thing said the seal. Oh, you wait. It'll get its strength back. It will get its strength back. Mm -hmm. You know, I never used to believe in that mythical sea monster that all the human beings believe in that they're so afraid of they won't even talk about it. But now that I've seen with my own eyes this, I think that's exactly what it is. Oh, it will get its strength back. And then We'll see what it gets up to. And without another word, that seal flicked her tail and off she went. Well, all the little fish were just astonished. They were open mouth. They said, so much knowledge. We are so smart now. I just wonder if any of it's true. The little fish said, well, you know, we could go find out. We could swim down there where it rests, where all those other creatures are gathering, and we could see what they have to say about it. But his brothers and sisters said, mm-mm, mm-mm. It is no concern of ours anymore. We wouldn't flutter a fin to find out any more about that thing. And off they went up to the surface.
But our little fish went down to find out more. And on his way down to the ocean floor, he was amazed at this beautiful world he had been born into. Oh, there were jellyfish like transparent plants floating by on the currents. There were little seahorses darting this way and that. There were big schools of fish, like his little school of 1800 brothers and sisters, only these were huge shoals of fish swimming as one body. There were eels, all manner of creatures. And on his way down, he met a seal. Not a seal, he met a whale. It was a young whale, but it was still big. And he said to the whale, 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 please don't eat me. I, I'm so little. Um, you couldn't even taste me if you tried. And besides that, I've just started this business of being alive. And I do so love being alive. And I'm, I'm not ready for that experience to end yet. The whale said, what are you doing down here, little fish? You are way out of your depth all the way down here. What brings you into this part of the ocean? So the little fish explained about the horrible sea creature, that long, skinny thing, heavy thing that landed on the bottom of the ocean floor and caused so much chaos up higher up. The whale heard him and he laughed. He laughed so hard he snorted water and it blew out his blowhole. He said, so that's what tickled my back a few minutes ago. I was just turning around and I felt something tickle. I thought it was a ship's mast, but that's what it must have been. You know, I was on my way back here to see if I could find that ship's mast to make it into a back scratcher. But your story is quite interesting. Let's go explore and see what we shall see. So on their way down to where they could see the big mysterious thing resting without making a move. On their way down, they met, they met some other creatures who decided to come with them. They met a swordfish and a shark and an eel and a catfish. And there they were, their little band all together. And the catfish said, you know, if that thing is as skinny as you say, it's no bigger than an anchor cable. I'll bite it in half if it gives us any trouble. Yes, I will. You know, these teeth of mine, they can make a dent in a ship's anchor. And he opened his mouth wide and revealed all six rows of teeth. Well, the companions swam down and they could see that already this mysterious sea serpent had drawn a big crowd, all just waiting around there wondering what it was going to do, hoping something might come of it. Well, the sea polyps, the sea polyps kind of touched it with their tentacles. Crabs were walking tightrope across it. The sea cucumbers, they rolled over against it as if they were trying to nestle, as if they were crying, trying to get a scent from it. Gorgonia waved over it, looking this way, that way, wondering, what is this thing? And all the time, all the time, that cable lay where it lay, stretching across canyons, across underwater mountain ranges, through wildernesses of seagrass, hundreds and hundreds of miles thrumming, vibrating with all the thoughts it was carrying. It was full of thoughts, full of human thoughts, full of information traveling from coast to coast in a matter of seconds. And it lay there silent. Well, a sea polyp said, I'll see what it's made of. And it pushed one tentacle underneath the creature and one over it, encircling it. And it said, I don't think it has, I know it doesn't have scales, but I don't even think it has skin or, or a belly. I can't tell belly from backbone. 
how does this creature give birth? Well, the whale, the whale went down and he made a very respectful bow. And he said, tell us, tell us, are you animal or are you a plant or are you from up above and a creature who cannot live down here? Well, the telegraph cable was full of answers, but it kept its own counsel. It was very still. It was unresponsive. And this irritated all those creatures. Finally, the catfish went up to it and said, listen, are you going to answer or you, will you be bitten in two? You decide, answer or be bitten in two. And all the other creatures took up the chorus. Yes, answer or be bitten in two. And that cable just lay there. It thought, well, let them bite me in two then. If I am damaged, I will just be taken up and mended, as has happened to countless of my relations who are not half as long as I am. It had plenty of thoughts, but it kept them to itself. And frankly, the cable thought that these questions that the other creatures were asking him, they were impertinent. After all, he was doing what he was supposed to do. He was lying there on official business, attending to his own business. So there he lay still. Well, all of a sudden, of one accord, all the creatures shouted, attack! And then, oh, the melee. Well, a shark tried to bite the thing with its teeth. And of course, the catfish went to bite it in two. But the swordfish, in an effort to stab the thing, glanced off its slick side and right into the bottom end of the catfish. The seahorses were battling over it scared the poor snails so badly they went into their homes and they didn't come out for a long time and you know there were lobsters and crabs who were scared right out of their shells they abandoned their shells never to see them again well it took a long time for the mud to settle and then all the creatures exhausted looked at that thing that thing that was unaffected by their huge attack Nighttime came and with it, the bioluminescence of all the plankton and the other glowing creatures that are seen at night, casting a mysterious glow over this most mysterious intruder. And all the creatures looked at it and they said, if only we knew what it was or what it wasn't. That is a very important question. At that moment, a sea cow came swimming by. A sea cow. Um, human beings call them mermen or mermaids. This one was a mermaid. She had a fish's body. She had the torso of a woman with breasts and hair hanging over, hair dripping with plankton and parasites and glow in the dark and plant grass and oh she was so proud of the way she looked and she could see their confusion she said <laughs> you want enlightenment i see all right i'll give you enlightenment since i am the most enlightened being here i am a creature from above and i am a creature from below and i understand both worlds she said, what you are looking at there is an invention of the human beings. Whatever they invent is bound to turn to junk. And whatever comes from up above and lands here, eventually it's trash. What you see here is inert. It's not going anywhere except right here. It's, it's absolutely absolutely of no importance. 
the little fish said, well, you know, I think perhaps it might be of some importance. Oh, and what do you know, Pipsqueak, said the sea cow. Yeah, mackerel, keep your mouth shut, said the other creatures. The sea cow went on. She said, this is just another one of those human beings' ploys to trap us. That's all they try to do is, is get us to take their bait. They have their weighted nets they throw down. They have their fishing hooks baited with morsels of food that they think will bite on. What do they think? We're stupid? No, don't touch it. Eventually it will fray, it will come apart, it will disintegrate, and then its pieces will just lie there forever harmless. It is of no good to anyone. And then abruptly, she left. But all the other creatures in chorus said, no good to anyone. And you know, they felt kind of good. Finally, having an opinion, even if it wasn't their own, about this thing. Well, it was not an opinion that the little tiny fish shared, but he knew better than to open his mouth. He thought though, actually, I believe this is perhaps the most marvelous creature in the ocean. And of course, we know that he was right. That cable continued to grow until it spanned oceans, it spanned continents, it went from pole to pole around the equator, and all the world was connected, and it is growing still. It has expanded out of the ocean, carrying thoughts at the speed of light, bouncing them off of satellites, off of towers on the earth. It is growing and growing and growing, and is not going to stop because what it is, we know. It's the Midgard worm. That horrific, huge sea monster, the serpent in whom lies all knowledge of good and evil. That tiny little fish was absolutely That's the great sea serpent. I, I, I'm almost speechless. I, I can't even imagine anyone else telling this story. Yeah, that was a and big boom moment right there. <laughs> Megan, what? Maybe you have been a fish in many lifetimes. <laughs> We're so vivid. And so interesting. I mean, Rachel Hedman's writing about all the things to ponder. It's true. This is a quite extraordinary story. And of course, it found you, called you out, and you. <laughs> no, you, you dumped yes. it on me, lady. I didn't. I, I work for the imagination, but you <laughs> were the right one, <laughs> as Katie was the right one for the elderberry. So yeah. um, incredible. You know, it, it, we talk about this all the time, and Simon and I keep talking about it, what it's like to hear week after week all these different Anderson stories brought to life by fantastic storytellers, like lifting it off the page and making it breathe and live. But from one artist, just sort of extraordinary. I, I cannot thank you both. Um, Let's hear a little bit about what it was like first Megan, because it was only five or six days ago where I said, please, can you help? It's Monday. <laughs> Monday. <laughs> I have no, and you said, oh, this is barely um, ready. Well, I, I can't imagine it being any better and more authentic and generous and beautiful than it was. But what was it like working on these stories? Grueling. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
you gave me the name Eric Hogard as a translation. I read one translation on just my first Google search and it had all the bits of the story, but the language was really pretty lackluster. And then I read Hogard's translation and I thought, oh, okay, okay, I can work with this. Yeah. And then I found another translation somewhere else. Um, it might have been the actual text. I don't know where that the third one came from, but I just dissected it beat by beat by beat by beat and figured out which parts I absolutely must not yeah. forget. I forgot a lot of that. I mean, a lot of that just swam away. But, um, See, she's then, a fish. She's yeah. a fish woman. <laughs> and it's pretty much just been in my head for five days, and I'm I'm kind of ready for a brain dump now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? It, we're so embodied, and 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 your choice of the um, elderberry mother was such a beautiful choice of story, also. You, you know a lot about these stories and about when Anderson was writing, Katie. Well, I, 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 well, first let me just say, I really enjoyed Megan's story of the tiny little fish being right all along and all of the misinformation that, yeah. that comes through. Uh, it's just delightful and, and that Anderson wrote that story in, in his lifetime during a time when all of these transatlantic uh, cables were being laid down uh, some of them worked, some of them didn't, and uh, it was just really fun. And what did, what was the name? They, they finally decided it was a something worm? Um, the Midgard Worm. It's yeah. the harbinger of, it. it's prophesied to be Odin's uh, nemesis. It and Odin are each other's nemeses. And when they fight, when they clash, that will be the end of, that will be Ragnarok, the end of the world as we know it. Yeah. And then the gods will convene and start their chess game again in another world. Uh -huh. So this is, it's the beginning of the end. Uh -huh. so this is one of the joys of, of reading Anderson and, um, you know, placing him in context. And he's just such an invitation to look at the history of everything. Um, but Mother Elderberry is a story that I especially love. Um, because I, I see Anderson writing that, you know, from his love of the natural world um, and, um, you know, his love of Denmark. And, and, of course, we have to remember Denmark was uh, being conquered back and forth by Germany during his lifetime. So he was quite a uh, nationalist. Um, but um, the love of the natural world and then the fact that Anderson never married even though he fell in love several times, um, he writes this story that uh, it is possible for people to marry and be in love for 50 years. Um, and it's almost like a prayer, um, I, I think, that he offered. Um, and I, I remember the first time I, I told that story out um, was shortly after my mother had died. And mm -hmm. My mother and father were fortunate to have a fine marriage. Um, but when I told it the first time, my father was in the audience, right in the center. And he just looked at me with this wonderful grin on his face. So I, I see that when, when I tell it. And, and also, you know, the friends that I have that are now starting to celebrate long, long, long marriages. We, you know. We need those stories of they lived happily ever after, <laughs> getting us through the hard times. Yeah. Well, I, this is wonderful. And um, actually, Katie had a great idea, and maybe we're going to do it one session, of just having like 10 storytellers telling either little pieces of or these stories in two minutes each, like a kind of mashup of them. Yeah. But we... We, we that was have... Megan's idea. Oh, <laughs> Megan's idea. That's a great idea, but I didn't think of it. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. That's all right. I, I, want to, I just want to take a minute because we're really trying to raise funds so that we can continue through the month of October where children, some children would go back to school, 
but many children will have to be online still. So we would love to ask if you would like to make a donation to help us to continue so that we can bring these stories. And um, also, we're thinking about doing some of the research on Anderson and asking all our storytellers for suggestions for um, which stories children could retell and what these stories mean. So you can make a donation, small or large. We love it. And um, Randall McGee, who has been with us two times and will be with us again, ha has spent his life telling the stories of Hans Christian Andersen, dressed as Andersen, and he's learned to do paper cuts the way Andersen did. And he sent me five paper cuts. So if anybody would like to, uh, we can auction these off. If anybody would like, I have, I think, four, five peas in a pod. Maybe you oh, can put this up so we could just see it. Yep. Getting there. <laughs> yeah. That's such a wonderful story. Uh, the yeah. five peas in the pod where he, it, it tells of the hope that can come from watching uh, a little pea plant grow. And um, then it also captures all the different journeys of each of the five peas, which is charming. And so we have small, medium, and large. <laughs> and if anybody would like to, uh, you know, put up a, an amount that you'd like to pay for it, we would love that. And I will send it to you. So you'll also send us your phone number. And the second paper cut that he did is a wonderful story. And Katie will tell us about it, that Randall told that you can um, look up. Um, these are all online. That's, that's the collar. And, and one, of, one of the very special points of Hans Christian Andersen is his, the way he can capture perspective or point of view. And this, the story is, uh, captures the point of view of a uh, stuffy collar and uh, the arrogance. And um, he, he does a lot of social commentary. Um, yeah, we've noticed that in a, lot of the, in a lot of these stories. There's a lot of social commentary. Maybe somebody has to make a leap for either the collar or five peas in a pod. Mm -hmm. And Randall, this particular one is what's called a practice piece. So he said, I make prior to cutting a design as I tell the story live. Uh -huh. So each piece is unique. And this one was the practice one. And then while he told the story, this was the one he cut. So anybody want to um, purchase yeah. one? Just somebody should leap in and give us a, a price. <laughs> and then, or you can do it later and contact me at, um, I'll give you my email and you can send me um, which one you'd like and they're quite wonderful. Mm -hmm. But help us make this happen. We really want to uh, continue. And please so did, did Randall story. make a couple of those extra ones so that people could bid on them? Did he do that especially for this? Yeah, some of them. Yes, he did. The five peas in the pod is especially for us. So at the bottom of the screen right there, folks, um, boop, boop, down below, our wonderful guests, paypal.me, HCA Story Center. Um, you can... Um, give a donation. Um, it's best if you email Laura first, just to make, you know, so that if people do want to outbid each other <laughs> or anything like that, then uh, Laura can be in charge of that. So please do send an email to storymentor2010-2010 at gmail.com. And uh, she will, she would love for them to be sold, the money going to the Hans Christian Anderson Storytelling Center, and she'll love to mail those out to you. I mean, we don't pay our storytellers a lot, but we make sure that every storyteller receives something. And uh, we purchase the platform and spend hours preparing and preparing. And we really love this. And we've had, you know, like online, we have maybe 35 or 40 people listening in the morning, at least on Facebook. 
But mm -hmm. during the week, we have from 500 to two, sometimes 3,000 people all over the world who are listening to stories. And that thrills us. These are yeah. stories for all ages. And Anderson was very, very committed to social, compassionate commentary. And also a lot of them, like Mother Elderberry, and obviously uh, this other story, The Great Sea Serpent, are about his life and his experience and his concern in a very, very um, rigid, conventional time in Denmark. So it has a lot of relevance to us today, and we really need to be uplifted and um, listen to these stories with fresh ears. So and and I, want, I just want to say that um, the storytelling community and the listeners just are so thankful for the time and effort that you, Laura, and Simon are, are putting into bringing this and out and making it happen. You're very welcome. It's a... Uh... It's it's wonderful actually. I've learned so much from everybody that I've worked with. So it's it's good. It's been really good. Thank you. And we lo we love your comments, people. Thank you so much for listening. Although we know lots of people like to tune in later, we love that you're here with us. And yes. a lot of storytellers listening. A lot of wonderful storytellers like Mike Faucherty and uh, Angela Lloyd. Jane Dorfman, Via Good, Rachel Hedman, Regina Russ, um, Jean Hale is with us. Robin Eleanor Beatty. Benjamin in Canada. Ross Tarr, Luann Adams in New York. Kathleen Rapolt from Berlin. Rudiger Gould, who has come to every single storytelling. He must be dreaming of Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really Robin Beatty in Brooklyn, is, um, who is really, she's going to help me this coming month, but I really want to thank Judith Heinemann, who has volunteered and contacted all the storytellers so that they're really prepared. And the Anderson board, particularly Anna Meta Anderson, who really support us and stand behind us, and the Parks Department who has helped us so much. So um, thank you all. Please um, decide to buy a paper cutting. <laughs> and next weekend, it's actually uh, Milbury Birch, Heather Forrest, and myself. And the three of us have been twice a year doing something called The Gathering. So we're telling we're telling a single story each, and then we're telling one story that has three stories. And then all afternoon, we're offering a seminar on choices that storytellers make and bringing a storyteller to life, the creative choices that one makes at a time like this to tell a story. So please join us again if you want to go through the YouTube and listen to other stories that have been told, please do. If you love these, which we loved, uh, <laughs> you can listen again and again. So here's our information for YouTube and Facebook. Thank you all so, so much. It's really heartwarming to know that we come together to listen to these stories at this time. It feels great. Simon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Simon. Bye.